Uh, we just finished the holiday of Sukkot. And Rod and I recently did a radio show um, in the last few weeks called Sukkot, the Universal Holiday. It's the most significant holiday of the holidays, I think, especially for the people of the nations, regardless of what you call yourself, regardless of your label, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Noahide, whether you're a Gare, whether you're a Gare Noahide, whether you're a Noahide Gare, um, whatever your label is, it's a significant holiday for you. And according to the Torah, there are 70 primary nations which are the roots of diverse national groups and cultures which we have today. I just want to show you a picture and talk a little bit about the purpose of the seminar. This picture is, 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 was such an amazing thing for me in my life. This is a sofer, speaking of Torah scrolls, this is a sofer, a scribe, that's writing a Torah scroll at the synagogue in the ruins of Masada, at the top of Masada in Israel. And it's just amazing to think that one of the oldest synagogues uh, in the world um, that today, that where people had martyred them, themselves rather than being taken by the Romans for the sake of Hashem, for Kedush Hashem, for the holiness of Hashem, would now have a sofer, a scribe writing a Torah scroll. This is so significant for me because of the truth of God's word. And the truth of God's word from a Jewish perspective. Because so many people of my people have given their lives over thousands of years for the sake of maintaining the Torah. Um, when we have these arguments, when we have arguments and we have disputes and we have discussions with people of different faiths, I always have to remind them the bottom line is that it's my people, it's my rabbis, it's my sages who are the ones who preserve this very Torah, this very Tanakh that you now get to argue with me about. So this is a very significant thing, and this is why we need to look at that. And this is why a seminar like this is so important. Because many of you, uh, like me, have had a different journey. This is a new place for you. This is a new journey for you. Many of you might have come from another faith system. Many of you might have been Christians. Many of you have you know, worshipped in a different way. And now you've suddenly come to Torah. You suddenly recognize that there's a truth beyond the truth that you thought was truth and you're diligently seeking God and recognizing that it is the very people who, has, who, who gave their lives to preserve this Torah are the ones that you need to seek out now for wisdom, the sages of Judaism. So the purpose of the seminar, before we get to the 70, is A, to combat Jewish evangelism. And I, I like to say up front when I do a seminar like this that I am not anti-Christian and that I'm not even anti-missionary. I actually call myself a counter-missionary, and people often say, well, what's the difference? The difference is that uh, anti-missionaries tend to be more attacking. I'm not attacking. I, I don't have any problem with a Christian. I have no problem with the, the, the many thousands upon thousands of Christians. I mean, especially in Houston, I'm amazed. I thought some of the places I lived had a lot of churches. I mean, you drive around Houston, it's I'm, I'm not used to the South, you know, with that many churches, and big churches. I mean, I'm used to seeing little churches. There are some really big churches here. And I, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with those people. I don't have a problem with Christians who want to worship the way they want to worship. The problem I have is that they don't allow me and my people to worship the way we want to worship. So when I talk about combating Jewish evangelism, I'm fine with a Christian that wants to worship the way they want to, as long as they leave my people alone and they leave me alone. The other thing that we want to do is we want to educate and empower both Jews and Noahides or Gerim, people who are strangers, people who have attached themselves to Hashem and are looking to attach themselves to Hashem in the proper way. And then finally, to usher in true redemption spoken of in the Tanakh. And this is where we're going to get further on in the presentation tonight in the idea of salvation and redemption as it relates to the Tanakh, as it relates to a Jewish perspective. When we talk about the 70 nations on the earth, we're in this week's Torah portion, this very Torah portion in the book of Breshit, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 10, verse 32, we read, 
These are the families of Noah's descendants, according to their generations, by their nations. And from these, the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. The significance of the number 70 in Judaism has to do with what we call Shiva Panim, or facets, or faces of Torah. Shivim Panim La Torah talks about that each verse of the Torah can have 70 different interpretations. They don't have 70 different Christian interpretations. They have 70 different Jewish interpretations because we can look at the Torah in so many different ways. Um, for instance, in Psalm 62, verse 12, it talks about one thing God has spoken, two things have I heard. Very interesting verse from Tehillim, from the Psalms. The Midrash teaches us that 70 nations emerged from Noah in Numbers Rabbah 14.12. And then the Torah also states that the festival offerings that we bring during the seven days of Sukkot include 70 bulls. So we see that very significant number of 70. According to the Torah, there are 13 bull offerings on the first day of the festival, 12 on the second day, 11 on the third day, 10 on the fourth day, and it descends. And if you were to go and look in the book of Numbers, you would see that the total number of bulls that are offered are 70 bulls. The Talmud explains that these offerings are on behalf of the 70 primary nations of the world from Sukkot 55b, and this is from that Masechet, from this tractate of Talmud, where it says, Rav Eliezer stated, to what do these 70 bullocks that were offered during the seven days of the festival correspond? He says, to the 70 nations, to what does the single bullock of the eighth day correspond to? The unique nation. So it talks about the 70 bullocks related to the 70 nations that were, set, that were descended from Noah, and the one that was brought on the eighth day, which is Shemini Atzeret, which is the eighth day assembly that we read about after the seven days of Sukkot, is for the unique nation. So it show, talks about offerings for the nations and an offering for the people of Israel. It goes on to say, this may be compared to a mortal king who said to his servants, prepare for me a great banquet. But on the last day, he said to his beloved friend, prepare for me a simple meal that I may derive benefit from you. The next portion from the Talmud is something that most people are unaware of as it relates to the sacrifices described. And it's pretty powerful. It says, Rav Yochanan observed, woe to the idolaters, for they had a loss and do not know what they have lost. When the temple was in existence, the altar atoned for them, but now who shall atone for them? That's a very powerful statement from the tractate of Sukkot 55b, because it doesn't say, woe to the Jews, that they no longer have an altar to offer sacrifices on. It says, woe to the idolaters. It's speaking about the fact that when the temple was destroyed and there was no longer an opportunity to have sacrifices for the nations that they no longer had a way to atone for themselves. Very different than what you've been taught over your lives, over, over the life for those of you that uh, were Christians at one time. And on the surface, someone might want to speak about the concept of vicarious atonement as it relates to that. Because it says, who will atone for them? But notice again that it's speaking not about B'nai Yisrael, but it's speaking about idolaters. And I want to inject something here about sacrifices. Something that I have just noticed in my own study. Something that I consider so powerful that along with the rest of our teaching tonight, 
for me, clears up the whole error of the vicarious atonement concept. Because history teaches us the following. History teaches us that during the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, during the time of Moshe, it was the general practice of all nations to worship by means of sacrifice. Meaning that every culture at that time, in biblical times, was offering sacrifices to their gods. This was not something that's disputed. There were many associated idolatrous practices that went along with offering sacrifices to the gods. But our great Jewish philosopher, many of you I'm sure have heard of Rambam, Maimonides, stated the following. He said, God did not command the Israelites to give up and discontinue all these manners of service because to obey such a commandment would have been contrary to the nature of man who generally cleaves to that which he is used to. For this reason, he says, God allowed Jews to make sacrifices, but he transferred it to his service, that which had served as a worship of created beings and of things imaginary and unreal. All the elements of idolatry were removed. This is the great philosopher Rambam, who says that this was not something that God commanded, but this was something that God allowed because of the idolatrous practices of the nations, because B'nai Yisrael was involved in and around those idolatrous practices. I mean, when you consider the fact that most of the instructions that they were given, and specifically given as it relates to the sacrificial system, came after Yitziat Mitzrayim, after their deliverance from Egypt. Were they in Egypt for several hundred years? Absolutely. Was, he, was Egypt an idolatrous culture? Absolutely. Was Egypt offering sacrifices to idols? Absolutely. If you're living within a pagan culture for that many years, you are what Rambam explains as used to something. And it would be impossible, it would go totally against the nature of the Jewish people having been delivered to be totally stripped of something that they had become used to. Thereupon, he continues, the Holy One, blessed be he, said, let them at all times offer their sacrifices before me in the tabernacle, and they will be weaned from idolatry and thus be saved. I like when Jews talk about being saved. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I like when Jews talk about being saved because our definition of being saved is totally different when somebody comes up to me and asks me if I'm saved. I say, absolutely, I'm saved. Hashem has saved me so many times, I can't even count them on my fingers anymore. And thank God he's still saving me every day. Maimonides concluded, by this divine plan, it was effected that the traces of idolatry were blotted out and the truly great principle of our faith, the existence and unity of God was firmly established this result was thus obtained without deterring or confusing the minds of the people by abolition of the service, something that they had become accustomed to. The Jewish philosopher Abar Benel reinforced Maimonides' argument. He cited a midrash that indicated that the Jews had become accustomed to sacrifices in Egypt, just what I talked about a minute ago. And to wean them from these idolatrous practices, God tolerated the sacrifices, but commanded that they be offered in one central sanctuary. And the Abarbanel writes, as I read, um, about uh, what I just read. The slide was what the Abarbanel said. What's interesting is that Rashi also, Rashi, who's the greatest Torah commentator in Judaism, indicated that God did not want the Israelites to bring sacrifices. He says it was their choice. And he bases this on the Haftorah portion of the prophets read on the Sabbath when sacrifices are discussed. And this is that portion that Rashi comments on. 
from Isaiah 43, 23, where it says, You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not bur burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. It says, You did not bring me the lambs of your burnt offerings, but to idolatry. This is Rashi now. This is his exact commentary. Now, if you were to go, and I know, I'm, I'm sure most of you are not fluent in biblical Hebrew or fluid, fluid in you know, Mishnaic Hebrew or some of, the, some of the Hebrew that's written in commentaries. But if you were to go to Chabad.org, which has the Tanakh, and it has the Tanakh with Rashi's commentary, this is taken from that. I took it in the English from the Rashi's commentary on Chabad.org where he says, neither did I overwork you, the coal in there, cause you to do much work with the meal offering, merely a handful would, it be, would be offered to the Most High, and even that I did not ordain upon you to sacrifice as an obligation, but as a free will offering. This is Rashi saying that the sacrifices were never meant as a commandment and never, were never meant as an obligation but were simply free will offerings. What, what do we know about this? We know from Leviticus chapter 1 verse 2, which I don't have up, but if you look at Leviticus chapter 1 verse 2, it says, when a man brings a sacrifice. The Hebrew there is the Hebrew word ki, which alludes to the idea of if you bring a sacrifice. Not when I commanded you to bring a sacrifice, but if or when you bring a sacrifice, this is the way you're to bring it. That is the very first time that we see the concept of sacrifices spoken about in the Torah. And again, it speaks in a language that doesn't speak about obligatory sacrifices, but speaks about sacrifices that were brought as free will offerings. This goes on to bring Jeremiah 7.22 and 7.23, which is what is brought by the biblical commentator, the Radak. For those of you that don't know who the Radak was, this was Rabbi David Kimchi, who is also um, one of the great biblical commentators. And the Radak says this, based on these verses, for in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this command I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the way that I command you, that it may be well with you. So again, the Radak brings the argument that sacrifices were not commanded, but were free will offerings. Rav Cook, the first chief rabbi of the nation of Israel, one of the great modern day sages of Judaism, Rabbi Cook believes that the animal sacrifices will not be reinstated in the Messianic age. He also agrees with this idea of them being not obligatory, but being free will offerings. Now, I love Rabbi Cook. Rav Cook is one of my favorite people to read, but I think I have to disagree with him on this. Not that I think that he's wrong about the animal sacrifices, but he says the reason why there won't be animal sacrifices is because you and I will have elevated ourselves to the point that it won't require for us to bring uh, an animal sacrifice for sin that all we will bring is free will offerings of grain and, and, uh, and incense and so forth. I don't know about you, but I know I have not elevated myself to that point yet. Maybe you guys have. Right. We could go on and look at verses like um, Hosea 6.6 6 that says, What I want is mercy and not sacrifice. We will look at Isaiah 11. Uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 1, verse 11 through 16, that says, To what purpose is a multitude of your sacrifices to me? Says the Lord, I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or he goats. Bring no more vain oblations. Your new moon and your appointed feast my soul hates, and when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Uh, when you make many prayers, I will not hear, hear because your hands are full of blood. Now, a lot of Christians will bring that verse and argue with me and say, well, God hates your, your new moon, uh, your celebrations and everything else. But you know what the difference is? The difference is the wording there. 
God says, I hate your new moon celebrations and your um, appointed feasts. Because when you read what God says, God says, these are my appointed feasts. See, they weren't keeping God's appointed feasts. They were going back into idolatrous practices that they knew about, and they were making up their own way in which to worship, worship Hashem. So you need to know that, and you need to look at that and understand. In Amos chapter 5, um, we see this as well. I hate and despise your feasts, and I will take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Yea, though you offer me burnt offerings or your meal offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. He goes on. Deeds of compassion and kindness toward all creation are of greater significance to God than sacrifices. We see this all throughout the scriptures. When we then look at the 70 sacrifices offered on behalf of the nations, we learn from Rashi on Sukkah 55b that we read earlier, in his commentary on this Talmudic passage, Rashi explains that the purpose of these offerings, as we already discussed, is to seek atonement on behalf of the 70 nations so that the entire world will merit rain during the coming year. Because we know in Zechariah 14, if we look at that, it talks about the fulfillment of this. This is why Rod and I did a show called Sukkot, the Universal Holiday. Because the fulfillment of that is in Zechariah 14, when it says all nations will come and worship the king, when Mashiach, when the true Mashiach comes and takes the throne as king of Israel on behalf of Hashem, then all nations will come. And what happens? What's the punishment for the nations that don't come and worship? They don't have rain. What's interesting is that Rashi in his commentary on the biblical passage contradicts himself. In the Talmudic passage, Rashi says that the 70 bulls are for the atonement of the nations. But when you look at it in the scripture, what he says is that the 70 bulls represent the fact that they descend from 13 to 12 to 11 to 10 represents the destruction of the nations. What? How does he say on one hand that it's about the atonement of the nations, and then on the other hand, he contradicts himself and says that it's about the destruction of the nations? And he says the bulls of the festival are 70, corresponding to the 70 nations, and they progressively decrease in number, i.e. each day fewer, fewer bulls are offered than the day before. This alludes to the eventual destruction of the nations. This is his commentary on Numbers 29, 12 through 34. How do we understand the contradiction? And this is where I'm trying to get you to think today because this is a very normal thing that you see in Judaism. In Judaism, when you look at text, it's very normal for us to see contradictions. It's very normal to see argument. It's very normal to see argument in a tractate of Torah, where in the Gemara, the rabbis are arguing back and forth. This is the 70 facets of Torah. This is the 70 faces of of Torah. Why do we do this? Why do we have the, the arguments? We have the arguments because we want to hold that diamond up of Torah. And we want to look at every facet of it. We want to turn it. We want to look at it. We want to see how the light shines through it this way. See if there are any occlusions. See if there are any errors. So that when we look at every facet, when we look at every side of that diamond, when we conclude that this is the way we are following, this is the way our sages taught us, that that's the right way because we've looked at it from every angle. I'm trying to get you to understand, is there really a contradiction from Rashi? No, not at all. Because at the end of the day, what Rashi means by the destruction of the nations is that in that day, there will no longer be a distinction between the nations and B'nai Yisrael. The nations will cease to exist because we will all be one. Zechariah 14.9, something that I pray just prayed twice, but prayed three times a day. When I was in the room davening Mincha and Marev, at the end of the Elena, what do we say? And in that day, Hashem will be one, and His name shall be one. And both Rashi and all of the commentators that speak about the 70 nations 
and the 70 bulls being offered bring their teaching culminating to an end with Zechariah 14.9. That in that day, Hashem will be one and his name will be one. There's an amazing teaching that Rashi does on the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. He says, Hashem is our God, meaning that Hashem is the God of the Jewish people, but Hashem will be their God. This is Rashi's commentary on the Shema, that God is now God of the Jewish people, but one day, based on Zechariah 14.9, all nations will worship together and there will be no distinction. We see in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it will happen in the ends of days that the mountain of the temple Hashem, of Hashem will be firmly established as the head of the mountains and it will be exalted above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Because every single society will do the will of Hashem as one. The prophet Zephaniah brought and proclaimed the following divine message from Hashem. In Zephaniah 3.9, For then I will cause the peoples to speak a purified language so that they all will proclaim the name of Hashem to serve him with a unified resolve or united resolve. Rav Shimshon Hirsch, also one of our great modern day sages, discusses the future demise of the nation state in his commentary to Tehillim, Psalm 67, 5, when he says, let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. Rabbi Hirsch writes that there will still be diverse peoples, each with its own characteristics, but all these peoples will be united through their acceptance of the divine sovereignty of Hashem and through their fulfillment of the divine will. In addition, he says, rulers of the nation states will retreat before God back into the ranks of the people, that there will no longer be rulers of nations. He explains that the former rulers will still work for the welfare of their peoples, but they will do so under the leadership of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, under the, the Holy One, blessed be He. Humankind's haughty eyes will be brought low, and men's arrogance will be humbled, and Hashem alone shall be exalted on that day. On the first day of Sukkot, we read a section from the book of Zechariah, Zechariah, which tells the following story about how Shem alone shall be exalted on that day. It's before the final redemption when this great military battle takes place, where all the nation states come and rise against Jerusalem. It says in Zechariah 14, 14, Behold, the day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you, for I will gather, I'm sorry, 14, 1, for I gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth to fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. The ancient hatred of the Jewish people will have surfaced. The ancient hatred of the Jewish people has surfaced and continues to surface to this day. It goes on to talk about a unique day known to Hashem, neither day or night, but it will happen towards evening that there will be light, and on that day living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. Remember, we're talking about water related to Sukkot again, very significant theme of the holiday of Sukkot. Living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, one half towards the eastern sea and one half towards the western sea in summer. In winter, will it last? And Hashem will be sovereign over all the earth. And on that day, Hashem will be one and his name will be one. In addition to the simple meaning, this also alludes to the spreading of the divine teachings. This alludes to 
the disseminating of Torah, because the Torah is considered living waters as well. It shall be that all who are left over from all the nations who had invaded Jerusalem will come up every year to worship the Sovereign, Hashem, who is God of all the hosts of creation, and to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. In their commentaries above on these passages, the Metsudat David and the Malbim, also two commentators, cite to a tradition that the defeat of the armed forces attacking Zion will take place during Sukkot. In order to commemorate this miraculous event, which inspires the nations to acknowledge the divine unity and sovereignty of Hashem, pilgrims from, from the nations will journey to the rebu rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, each Sukkot. And they will join us together, the Jewish people, when there will be no, sh no nations anymore, when we will bring the 70 offerings again on their behalf. We will then experience the fulfillment of the following divine promise from Isaiah 56. My house should be called a house of prayer for all nations. And this certainly speaks to how redemption will pl take place, not only for Israel, but more specifically for the nations. As a matter of fact, I teach and believe that we can easily make the argument that the Torah is in fact not about my people at all, but it's about you. It's about me, the Jewish people, us together, being or goyim, being a light to the nations, and ushering in the true redemption of God through bringing the nations in fulfillment of the things that we spoke about. Unfortunately, this is something that's inconsistent with Christian theology. We started off talking about earlier the three things that uh, this seminar is meant to produce. Empowering Jews and Noahides, ushering in true redemption and so forth, and this is where we get to it. The first thing that I want to talk about is the Tanakh versus the New Testament as it relates to Isaiah 43 through 45 and what the Apostle Paul teaches in Romans 11 about redemption. We already talked about Sukkot, the eradication of the nations earlier, so we won't need to go into that. When we look at this verse, in Isaiah 43, it says, Atem adei neum Hashem, you are my witnesses, declares Hashem, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any God after me. Anochi, anochi Hashem, ve'en mebaladi moshiach. I, I am Hashem, and beside me there is no Savior. Goes on in verse 12. I declared, and what? Saved, and proclaimed, when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Verse 13 goes on to say, Also henceforth I am he, there is none who can deliver from my hand, I work, and who can turn it back. This is very interesting when we look at verses like this in Isaiah 43, 10, 11, 12, 13, some of the verses that we'll look at in Isaiah 44, Isaiah 45 when it talks about there being no other God before me, no other God be formed before me, and so forth. Rod and I had this conversation, I have this conversation with people often. And uh, what we notice today is a very interesting phenomenon that I see. I see that there are many people that are still holding on faith um, in a Mashiach. There are people that say, I don't believe that Jesus is God, but I still believe he's the Messiah. And I'm telling you that these verses that we're looking at destroy that argument. 
Now, people are going to look at me strange when I say this, but you either have to believe that he's God or you have to believe that he's nothing. Because God himself just said, I am the only Moshiach. I am the only Savior. Now, we're going to get into the idea of the difference between Moshiach and Moshiach. Because one of the problems that people like myself and the rabbis that I work with notice for many people that are not fluent in Hebrew and certainly not fluent in Biblical Hebrew is they hear words that sound the same, they see words that look the same, and they just assume that words are the same. And that's not how Hebrew works. For those of you that are trying to learn Biblical Hebrew, for instance, you learn very quickly that Hebrew, most of Hebrew is based on three letter roots. That most words in Hebrew are based on three letter roots. So I can tell you just off the top that Moshiach is based on the three letter root Mem, Shin, Ayin. Moshiach. Mashiach is based on the three letter root Mem, Shin, Chet. From the Hebrew word Mashach, which we'll get into in a little bit. Isaiah 45, God alone. Ani Hashem ve'enod. I am Hashem and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you though you do not know me. So here we have, again, a verse that very clearly shows that you either have to believe that he's God or you have to believe he's nothing. So if you're listening tonight, if you're on live stream and you're one of those people that wants to maintain faith that he's still the Messiah, I can tell you that these scriptures that you follow, that you say you believe in the Tanakh, speaks against your faith system. It goes on, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. Again, none beside me. I am Hashem and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I will make well-being and create clam calamity. I am Hashem who does all these things. Now, I gave you an English translation, but that's not what the Hebrew says. You know what the Hebrew says there? The Hebrew says, Yotzer or uvore choshech, ose shalom uvore ra. It says, I create shalom, peace or completeness, and I create evil. Ra. See, there's nothing that God, there is nothing in this world that could be created that God didn't create. So if there's a Yetzahara, if, and I'm not talking, when I talk about the Yetzahara, and there are people that want to talk about Satan, and I'm not talking about, you know, uh, the guy with the pitchfork and the, the, the horns and the tail, you know, capital S, Satan, you know, because there is no such thing. You do know that there are no capitals in the Hebrew language, right? I hope Rod's at least taught you that much of Hebrew. You listening there, my, bu my bud? Yeah, he's listening. So, Satan simply means adversary. So if there's evil, if there's an evil inclination, if we have a Yetzer Ha, an evil inclination, or a Yetzer Tov, a good inclination, both of those, according to this verse, were created by Hashem. He created good, he created evil. There is nothing that could be created that wasn't created by God, and there certainly is no entity that could be equal to God, even be close to equal to God, or that could be an enemy of God. And if there is an enemy of God, then God created it. You follow? Another aspect of Isaiah 45 goes on to say, Ko amar Hashem lim shicho. Lim shicho. This is where we get into that mem shin chet. If you look at that, you see a lamet, a mem, a shin, a yud, a chet, and a vav. Who is this talking about? It's talking about Cyrus. Was Cyrus the Mashiach? Of course not. Cyrus was a foreign king. But there he says, God says, Ko amar Hashem, God says to his anointed. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, the gates may not be closed. His anointed, Cyrus. Then this is where we get into the concept of Moshiach 
versus Mashiach. God's, the God of redemption versus Paul's salvation of Romans. Now this is going to be hard, hard to read, I think. Well, no, it's not that hard for you. It's hard for me. <laughs> it's much smaller on my screen. I wanted to read to you from what Paul, Paul, Christian salvation, what Paul says in Romans chapter 10. He says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, who will descend into the abyss. You know, he's talking about uh, JC. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That's the Christian salvation. Let's look at the Jewish answer. This is from the book of Devarim, from the book of Deuteronomy, which is what? Paul is quoting from in Romans chapter 10. He says, For this commandment, which I command you this day, is not too hard for you. It's not far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, Who shall go up to heaven and bring it down to us and make us to hear it that we may do it? Neither is it beyond the sea, that thou should say, Who shall go over to the sea for us and bring it to us and make us to hear it that we may do it? But the word is very near unto you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil. In that I command you this day to love the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, his mitzvot, his chukot, and his mishpatim. Then thou shalt live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless you in the land which you go in to possess. A vast difference between what we read in Romans chapter 10, according to Paul, and what Deuteronomy 30, which he's quoting from, says. Because God doesn't say, what? God doesn't say, that you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart in order to be saved. God says, walk in my ways, keep my mitzvot, keep my commandments, keep my statutes, keep my ordinances, what? So it shall go well with you in the land that I will bless you in the land that I bring you in to possess. He goes on in Romans 11. I gave you Romans 10 as the beginning. This is what Paul goes on to say in Romans 11. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. Now we talked about this before. I talked about the ushering in of true redemption. This is a major revelation for people that come out of Christianity that now embrace the truth of Torah. This should be a great revelation to you. Because when you look at this concept, the very thing that Torah says, the very thing that Torah talks about, is the antithesis to what Paul is saying in Romans 11. The very nature of God's redemption has to do with what? With the 70 nations that we talked about. The very coming of the Mashiach, of the true Mashiach of God, comes when you, the nations of the earth, come and attach yourself in the right way to Hashem and the Jewish people, and we see the fulfillment of Zechariah 14.9. This is the complete opposite. They're saying that the Jews need to come to salvation in order for the Mashiach to come, and God says, wait, 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 wait. I already talked about this. It's the nations of the world that have to come. You, my Jewish people, I didn't save you because you're greatest of the nations. I didn't redeem you from, from Egypt because you're greatest of the nations. I redeemed you in order to redeem them. God saved us to save you. That's the message of the Tanakh. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is what the Tanakh says. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. 
the Jewish answer. That, that's what we read from Paul, okay? Paul says, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Romans 11, verse 27. So let's look at what the Tanakh says that he's basing what he just said on and see the difference in what the Tanakh says. What he's quoting from there is Yeshaya, Yeshiahu, Isaiah 59, verse 20, which says, and a redeemer, and I left the capital R there just to see whether or not you guys were on the ball there. And a redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares Hashem. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says Hashem. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says Hashem, va'ad olam, forever. So he's saying, I put these words in your mouth and it's not only for you, but it's for your offspring and it's for your, the offspring of your children and your children's offspring, ad olam, forever. Now they want, to come to us all, uh, they want to come to us all the time and say, well, you know, I'm keeping the feast now because God says the feast should be kept forever. Well, you know what? Maybe you ought to read all the verses where God talks about forever to get some insight about some other forevers, like the blessings of Hashem upon the Jewish people that don't require a vicarious atonement. The Christian version says what? What we read, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The Jewish version says, and a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares Hashem. One says that the deliverer will come and take away their sins. The other one says, we will turn from our sins and this is what will happen. This is when the Redeemer comes. When we turn from our transgressions, when we make tshuva, not when we look to somebody to take away our sins and make it easy for us. The word salvation in the Hebrew scriptures from the root word Yeshua, now, I had a very interesting conversation with Rabbi Federer. Rabbi Federer will be here tomorrow morning. He wasn't able to come tonight. Um, but Rabbi Federer said to me in the car when we were driving from Austin, he says, you know what I'd like you to do? Uh, like, I, like I don't have enough time on my hands with the things that I do already. He says, I'd like you to go in and see if you can find the first time that Yeshua is used to describe Jesus. You know, if we could find at what period in time in the world that the first time it was used. Some text the first time. So, that's, so I'm going to challenge you guys. Maybe you can help me out. And you guys that like to study, like Loretta, I know you're a studier. Maybe you can go in there and start doing some Google stuff and seeing whether or not you can find that information out. I'm, I'm giving you a job. You don't think you will? Okay. It can mean salvation or deliverance. And the vast difference between the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament is definition. Because salvation, when we talk about salvation and redemption from a Jewish perspective, salvation in Hebrew relates to physical salvation and not to spiritual salvation. It's not about being saved from something, from, from a, a spiritual uh, a situation. As a matter of fact, when you look at Breshit, at the very first chapter of Breshit, and you see the creation God speaks about creation, the six days of creation. And then at the end of the six days of creation, what does God say? It says he looked at everything he created and he says what? Everything is tov ma'od. Everything is very good. Who are we to suddenly say that everything that God who said he looked at it and he said everything is good, we suddenly decide, no, everything's inherently evil and we need to escape from this inherently evil world. See, that's the difference between the concept of tikkun olam repair of the world, and the idea of escaping to heaven. God never meant for a people to escape from this world. God is looking for you and I to repair this world to make it a habitable place in which he can dwell amongst his people again.
the same way he did with bringing the Mishkan, where he wanted to dwell, the same way that he allowed for a temple in which his spirit, his divine presence would rest, so that we could see the Shekhinah, the divine presence of God, once again dwell within his people. That's what we're looking for. When we look at uh, the salvation of God from the Tanakh, Az Yashir Moshe Uvne Yisrael, Et Hashira Hazot Lahashem Vayomru. It goes on. This is something we pray every morning, the Shacharis prayers. Az Yashir Moshe. This is the song of Moses. Moses sang with the people as they were standing, waiting to be delivered from Mitzrayim, as the Egyptians, as Pharaoh and the Egyptians were coming up behind them, and they had the, the sea before them. They started singing a song to God about God's salvation. And I know most of you have probably sang this song in a different way. I will sing them to the Lord. <laughs> the Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will glorify him. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. The salvation that is in this song is not talking about salvation being saved from a spiritual malady. It's the salvation being saved from the Egyptians coming up behind them and knowing that Hashem has delivered them from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. As we said, and a Redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from transgressions. So we see the Redeemer comes to those who have turned from their transgressions. They are not in need of a Redeemer who takes away their transgressions. The nuclear bomb, or one of the nuclear bombs. Where is Mashiach in the Tanakh? Do you know that these are the only two verses in the Christian scriptures where it actually says Messiah? And that's in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. Do you know how many times the word anointed appears, and yet the only time we see this is in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 and 26? And you'll notice that in red, the first verse has the Messiah. It's significant. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And then the second one just has Messiah. And I want to talk about Daniel 9, 25 and 26 for a minute, because I think this is an area that many people don't have an answer for, and I want to clear up the whole 62 weeks, 7 weeks issue for you with Daniel ta Daniel's timeline, so you have a very positive and strong answer for that person that comes to you and says, well, what about Daniel 9, 25, and 26 that talks about the Messiah being cut off and the 69 weeks, and that equals the time when Jesus was, uh, was uh, crucified on the cross? How do you answer that? Well, I'm going to give you the answer right now. Here I give you the Hebrew, Ad Mashiach Nagid, in the first verse, Ad Mashiach Nagid, and then you see Yikaret Mashiach. Those are very significant two phrases that we're going to see in the English here in a second. And we have to decide first whether or not we're talking about Messiah or anointed one. We just looked at Cyrus, where God says, Thus I say to Cyrus, my anointed, not Cyrus, my Messiah. If we look at the numerous times that Mashach appears in the Tanakh, we learn the following. It usually refers to kings, to priests, to judges, and to prophets. And how many times is Mashach translated as Messiah in the Christian scriptures? I already gave you the answer, if you can guess. Did you guess right? 925 and 926, the only times. What are the issues we see here besides translating as Messiah? The use of the word the that I just showed you in the first verse in Daniel 9.25 when it says the in the King James, unto the Messiah. I think it's interesting that at least one, the NAS left this out. Um, the NAS in 9.25, you see, doesn't say the Messiah. It says, you know, and when uh, you know and discern that from the issuing of, the, of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So they left the thought out. But let's go back to our old friend Cyrus the Anointed. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped. We read this verse. 
what we see from this is that there are three specific problems with the Christian translations of these verses. One, the translation of Mashach as Messiah rather than anointed, the capitalization of Messiah, and the inserting of the definite article the when it does not exist in the Hebrew. Because in the Hebrew, if we looked at that, it would say HaMashiach, if it was going to say the Mashiach. Now to tell you about Mashach, why I'm saying Mashach and not Mashiach, when I told you the root is Mem Shin Chet, does anybody know what Mashach means, the literal translation? Mashach comes from the verb to smear. Why is it translated as anointed? Because they were smeared or anointed with oil. So this is where the concept of anointing comes from, from the Hebrew verb to smear. Cyrus is important for two reasons, because he clearly shows us that the translation should have been anointed and not Messiah, and two, because the timeline of Daniel 9, 25, and 26 is also mistranslated and interpreted based on an agenda. The Daniel timeline, which talks about until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, it will be built again, speaking of the temple. What is meant by seven weeks and 62 weeks? And the question is, is there a concept in the Tanakh that explains this? Leviticus chapter 25, starting in verse 1, says, The Lord spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyards and gather in its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. So we see this concept of weeks and years, or weeks of years. Now this is interesting, we actually just came into Shemitah this year. This is talking about the concept of Shemitah, where the land lays fallow, and actually this year in Israel is a Shemitah year. And actually uh, when I go, there are Jews all over Israel now that will not eat certain things this year. Um, there are many Jews that will not sow their land, they will not sow, they will not harvest in this year. Um, there are many people that what they do is they sell the land, like you've heard the concept of selling chametz on Pesach. Um, the same way they sell chametz, some people will sell their land to a non-Jew to work their land during the Shemitah year as well. There is no dispute between both Jewish and Christian scholars that when we read in Daniel about seven weeks, that it refers to seven weeks of years, or 49 years. There's no dispute between the scholars on either side. Seven weeks of years equal 49 years. 62 weeks of years equals 434 years. And if you add those two together, you get 483 years. On the surface, it would appear that this is what we're supposed to believe. But does it? This is what Christians claim supports the timeline pointing to the death of Jesus. I showed you this, and it shows up a little bit off. It actually should be, uh, where should that be? This circle should actually be over here. And I gave you a very big picture here of this. Because what it's saying there is, from the time of the building, Ad Mashiach until Mashiach Nagid, Mashiach the Prince, will be Shavuim Shiva, seven weeks. This symbol here is called an Ednachta, and an Ednachta is similar, kind of similar to what our comma would be. Meaning that when you see the Ednachta there in the Hebrew, it tells you that the idea has ended and a new idea is beginning. So that when it says seven weeks there, it stops. So that you can't automatically say that when it says seven weeks and 62 weeks, that you add the two together and come up with 69 weeks. 
What it's saying is that until Mashiach the Prince, until the anointed Prince, will be seven weeks. Period, comma, semicolon, colon, whatever you want to put in there that tells you that the idea stops. V'achare hashavuim shishim ushanim, talking about, and after that, you will have um, the 62 weeks. So if we look at the Hebrew in a proper translation, we see shavuim shiva, and then, and then v'shavuim shishim ushnaim, which is talking about the 62 weeks. So there it's interesting that we have the grammar in there, that in this particular translation, that they actually put, they put the semicolon there to show you that there's a difference between the two. So this is what we should be reading. And you shall know and comprehend from the going forth of the word to return and to rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed prince will be seven weeks. That's the way it should read, that first part of the, voice, the verse. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one will be cut off. Now, do you notice a difference between those two verses that I just read and the way I read them? One says that when the word goes forth to rebuild, until an anointed prince will be seven weeks. But the second verse, the second part says, and after 62 weeks, an anointed one will be cut off. It doesn't say an anointed prince. It just says an anointed one. What we're talking about here is two different times and two different individuals. In verse 25, we have an anointed prince. In verse 26, we simply have an anointed one. What do we learn from the Hebrew here? We learn that there are two time periods being spoken of. Seven weeks and 62 weeks. That we're speaking about two completely different individuals, an anointed prince, and then just an anointed one that's cut off. And if we wanted to say 69, it would say 60 and 9, and not 7 weeks and 62 weeks. If you were to go back in your Tanakh and look at things like this, where you talk about lineages and years, it would say 62 and 9, or 62 and 7, or whatever. It wouldn't say it the way the language is used in these verses. I'd like to look at the second of the two individuals for a minute. Because as we read... In their, uh, in their translation, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And I said to you below that it's very significant when I read to you earlier where it says, Ye karet Mashiach ve'en lo. Specifically, Ye karet. Does anybody know what karet means in Hebrew? It's something that you read very often as it relates to B'nai Yisrael and relates to B'nai Yisrael when they do not do what God has called them to do. They are cut off. At the end of the day, even if you go with the 483 year Christian interpretation, the timeline is off by seven years. Meaning that if you go with their 483 years, it actually comes out to 39, the year 39. Most people say he died around 30 to 32, it comes out to 39, but then what they do is they say, well, there's solar years, there's lunar years, it's really not 365 days or this, it's actually 360 days, and that's how we come up with the 483 days. We already know that it doesn't make any sense because it's not 483 days, because it's seven weeks and then 62 weeks, two completely different time periods. When we get into this concept of karet, I'm giving you some verses here. And if any male who is uncircumcised fails to circumcise the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be karet, shall be cut off from his kin, from his people. He has broken my covenant. Genesis 17, 14. Exodus, Shemot 12, 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the very first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. Forever eats leavened bread from the first day to the seventh day. That person shall be karet, shall be cut off from Israel. Exodus 31, 14, you shall keep the Sabbath, 
for it is holy for you. He who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does work on it, that person shall be karet, cut off from among his kin. Vaikra, Leviticus 7.20. But the person who in a state of uncleanness eats flesh from Hashem's sacrifices of well-being, that person shall be karet, cut off from his kin. Leviticus 17.10. And if anyone of the house of Israel of the, or of the Gerim, of the strangers who reside among them, partakes of any blood, I will set my face against that person who partakes of the blood, and I will karet, cut him off from among his kin. Ask yourself the question, would the Messiah be identified as someone who was karet, cut off? Clearly, we simply have another case in Daniel chapter 9 of what I call creative archery. You know what creative archery is? It's when you shoot an arrow into a tree and then you draw a bullseye around it. There is, however, no greater piece of creative archery than the nuclear bomb of Isaiah 53 the suffering servant. How are we doing on time, Rod? Okay, everybody with me, okay? You wanna keep going with this? Okay. The Christian perspective says, come on, read it. Anyone can clearly see that this is speaking about Jesus. And the rabbis tried to hide this stuff. That's why they don't say it in the Haftorah. That's why you never see Isaiah 53 read in the Haftorah cycle in the synagogue every year. From our perspective, the suffering servant is clearly Israel. And there's nothing to hide. As there are many chapters that are not read in the Haftorah cycle. And since the Haftorah cycle began before Jesus, as evidenced by their own text, stating that he went into a synagogue and read from a Haftorah, why would it need to be hidden? So let's explore the issue of the servant. And since the Haftorah issue is a non-argument, let's move on to some very significant issues that shed light on these verses from the Hebrew. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye peoples, from far the Lord hath called me from the womb, and the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. This is from Isaiah 49.1, going on in 2, and he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and he hath made me a polished shaft in his quiver, hath he concealed me. Now people um, not only get creative with their archery, but they get creative with context. You know, anybody here does real estate? No? You know what real estate agents say all the time, right? About real estate, location, location, location. But when you're looking at the scriptures, it's context, context, context. Because you could look at those verse two verses and say, well, that sounds like it could be about him. But here's what verse three says. And he said unto me, thou art my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Not only is Israel the servant, but he says, in whom I will be glorified. God says he's going to be glorified in Israel. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and vanity, yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel be gathered unto him, for I am honorable in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. Yes, he saith, it is, is it too light a thing that thou should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the offspring of Israel? I will also give thee for a light to the nations. There's that Le'or Goyim, a light to the nations, that my salvation may be unto the ends of the earth. There's your verse. There's the answer. That you would be a light unto the nations to do what? So that my salvation, I, the only God, the God, there's none before me, none beside me, no other Savior, no other Messiah, no other Savior, 
says that my salvation shall be unto the ends of the earth as a result of my servant, the Or Goyim, a light to the nations. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel. I left the R capitalized again. Because this is the real Redeemer of Israel. The Lord who's speaking. The Holy One. To him who is despised of men, to him who is a board of nations, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord that is faithful, even the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen thee. It's a very interesting verse, isn't it? You know that there's another verse that sounds very similar to that. This is also from Isaiah 49. This is the continuation of those verses we just read. So let's look at that. It says, Just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. Now this is the Hebrew translation. The Christian translation will say, Just so he shall sprinkle many nations. Because that word, ken yazeh, the second word in Hebrew, comes from the idea of sprinkling, but it can also be spattering, and it can also be startling. This is actually from the very beginning of the fourth servant song, which, which most people don't realize that Isaiah 53 doesn't really start in Isaiah 53, but it actually starts in Isaiah 52.13. And that verse that we just read is from Isaiah 52.15, which comes just before and gives us a context of who is speaking. Because typically what you see said is that Isaiah 53, 1, God is speaking, and God is speaking about his suffering servant, the Messiah. But in Isaiah 52, 15, that we just read, just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him. If this is talking about the servant, and we've established that the servant is Israel, and not some suffering Messiah, then what we have here in context is um, it's speaking about nations being startled by what happens with the nation of Israel. When we look at these servant songs, and I put them up so if you wanted to look at them yourself, Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, Isaiah 49, 1 through 6 that we just read, Isaiah 50, verse 4 through 9, and Isaiah 52, 13, 53, 53 12, are what are called in Judaism, the four servant songs of Isaiah. And as I said, what we read from was Isaiah 52, 15. Let's look at some of these. The first one, Behold my servant who I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delights. I have my, put my spirit upon him. He shall make the right to go forth to the nations. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break and the dimly burning wick Shall he not quench? quench? He shall make the right to go forth according to the truth. He shall not fail nor be crushed till he have set the right in the earth and the isles shall wait for his teaching. Now typically that's all. Oh, just like Isaiah 53. If you read that, that's talking, about, that's talking about Jesus. But in verse 8 it says this, But thou, Israel, is my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou whom I have taken hold of from the ends of the earth and called thee from the uttermost parts thereof and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Isaiah 49, 3, as we read earlier, And he said unto me, Thou art my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. I focused on that because... That's very significant that he says that he will be glorified in Israel. In Isaiah 44, 23, it says, Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. So we're not just seeing it in one single verse that God says it. But here in 44, 23, he also talks about being glorified in Israel. But yet in the Christian texts, what do we see? We see in 1 Peter chapter 4, 11, and in John 13, 31 and 32, that it talks about God being glorified through Jesus. 
But God already said over and over again that he would be glorified through Israel. So again, we have a situation where we have a total contradiction. Now the bottom line is that we, those of us that are sitting here in, the, in this room, along with the thousands of Christians that are all over Houston, agree on the fact that the Tanakh, or what they call the Old Testament, should be the source document and evidence for our faith. And yet if you ask most of them, they've never read these. If you ask most pastors out there to tell you where it is that they're quoting from, they'll say, well, I know it's in there. I just don't, I, I don't have addresses like you have in your head. And you know what I usually say to them? Would you like me to give you the verse that you want to use to argue with me? And then I'll give you the verse that answers your question. And then they usually just walk away. Because I usually can tell within the first 30 seconds to a minute when I'm discussing something with somebody, whether or not they really want to hear what I have to say. And I'm not saying that I'm some, some Talmud Chacham, that I'm some great sage or scholar, that I know everything, but I know what I know. I know what the Tanakh says. It's very easy for anybody to know. All you have to do is be able to read. It's clear. Now for something completely different. Does anybody know Monty Python? I'm a big Monty Python fan. Anyway, or back to Isaiah 53. Verse 12, for, go, you sh for ye shall go, not go out in haste, neither shall you go by flight. For Hashem will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rearward. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. According as many were appalled at thee, so marred was his visage, unlike that of a man, and his form unlike that of the sons of men. It's got to be talking about Jesus. He was beaten. He was whipped. But to properly understand who the servant is, as we said, we have to determine who is speaking. And we've done that through context, where it says in verse 15, So shall he startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which they had not been told, them shall they see. And that which they had not heard, they shall perceive. In other words, all the nations of the earth have despised Israel. All the nations of the earth have seen Israel as this lowly, you know, uh, cast away servant of God, and yet all they keep seeing is the salvation of God. If you look at 1967, if you look at 1972, if you look at the wars, if any of you have ever been to Israel and been to a place called the Valley of Tears, 077, the tanks that, that were out there, there's a city in Syria that still remains uninhabited from that war, from the Yom Kippur War. There was only one tank there was still left standing of the Israeli army that stood against all these tanks. And you know what? There were tank commanders from the Syrian army that said that they saw angels standing there with, dro with drawn swords looking out at them when, they, when there was only one tank that was still operating on the side of Israel. The nations are startled. When we look back to our discussion of the servant earlier, we saw two verses that shed not only light on the servant, but also on in context to his speaking. Yea, he saith, it is too light a thing that thou should be my servant to raise up the tribe of Jacob that we read earlier. We talked about the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel. We should be able to stop here. Just from what I've shared now, we should be able to stop here as we have established the two most significant points from context. That A, the servant is Israel, and B, the speakers are the rulers of the nations who are startled by the servant. Rod sat with some pastors the other night, and they said, well, Israel died, didn't die on the cross for me. That's because they don't understand who the speaker is. If they understood in context that the speaker are the rulers of the nations who are startled by the deliverance of the nation of Israel, they would understand that they don't have to look to Israel for salvation, that they wouldn't have to look to anybody for salvation, that all they would have to do is look to Hashem for salvation, and he would deliver them. However, you know as well as I do that this is never going to be enough for the missionary. Let's look at the first three verses, but how about we look at them from a Hebrew translation? If you notice the red down in the bottom highlighted, that's significant, because in those first three verses it said, Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, 
and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. The Christian missionary tries to paint this as a picture of their suffering Messiah on a cross. However, this describes a servant who is despised and hated in life and not in death. And this certainly doesn't describe Jesus because in their own scriptures it talks about the thousands that followed along with him. So he certainly wasn't hated in, in, in life. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. This is part of their nuclear bomb. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. That word in the red there is mipsha'inu. Mipsha'inu in the Hebrew. And it comes from pe shin ayin pesha. So what is the problem if that is translated transgressions? The problem is that it says for our transgressions. Because mishpa'enu does not mean for our transgressions. When you see a mem in front of a word, it is the Hebrew for in a construct from. The Hebrew from. So what is the proper translation? It's from our transgressions. So what do we learn from that verse? We learn A, for our transgressions is a mistranslation with an agenda, and B, from our transgressions is the legitimate translation, which leads us to the following conclusion. The verse is not speaking about a servant that vicariously atones for the sins of others. Instead, the verse is speaking about the nations realizing that Israel is not sinning because of their own sins, but is suffering as a result of the transgressions of the nations against it. Because the speaker is the rulers of the nations, so when it says, from our transgressions, it's the rulers of the nations saying that we recognize we're startled because we come to the realization that they are suffering from our transgressions, not because of their own sins. And Psalm 94, verse 3 to 7 says this, How long shall the wicked, O Lord, how long shall the wicked exult? They pour forth words, they speak arrogantly. All who do wickedness vaunt themselves. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the orphan. They have said, The Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob pay heed. See, this is what the nations think. This is what the nations today that still hate Israel think. In verse 7 it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Here's the Tanakh answer to that Christian interpretation. Psalm 44, verse 11 and verse 22. You give us as sheep to be eaten, and have scattered us among the nations in verse 22, but for your sake we are killed all day long, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. So there again we have Israel be ide being identified as the sheep being slaughtered, and those being eaten as sheep, rather than a suffering Messiah. Verse 8, he was taken, taken from prison, and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off, he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. So we see something very interesting there. It says, Ki nigzal me'eretz chayim. The first thing we notice is that there is a different word we see here for cut off. It's not that same word that we previously saw, karet, which is being cut off for sins or being cut off for transgressions against God. We see this word nigzal. When we see that the servant is cut off from the land of the living, this is not the same thing as karet. This is not speaking about death. The land of the living in this context is an idiom in biblical terms for the land of Israel. Me'eretz chayim. 
He's speaking about Israel. All right, cooperate. By oppressive judgment he was taken away. Who could describe his abode? For he was cut off from the land of the living through the sin of my people who deserve the punishment. That's Isaiah 53.8. Let's look at what Jeremiah 11.19 says. For I was like a docile lamb led to the slaughter. Here we see again. I did not realize that it was against me. They fashioned their plots. Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living that his name be remembered no more. Did anyone notice a word that is also in this verse that we discussed in a previous verse? In verse, saw, we, in verse 5 we saw mipsha'inu, that verse from our transgressions. And then we see here as well the word mipesha. We see it right here, mipesha. Again we see the patient ayin. The same as we see patient ayin, mipsha'enu, from our transgressions, we see again mipesha. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he's cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people? No. Again, the same way we see the mem there, mipesha, is saying from. So we know from the Hebrew that this does not read for the transgressions, but from the transgressions. So rather than seeing this as a Messiah who's killed because of someone's sin, it is instead a servant who is cut off from the land of Israel as a result of the transgressions committed by the people of the speaker, who is the rulers of the nations. Now let's look at the Jewish nuclear bomb. They have what they consider their missionary nuclear bombs. Well, here are the two counter missionary nuclear bombs from the very same chapter. It is also believed that this is where there's a change in who, in, who, in who is speaking. In other words, it starts off with the rulers of the nations and then it's believed by some of the sages that then it changes into God speaking. From the Christian Bible translation in verse 9 and 10 we read, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. From the Hebrew we see two very significant things in those verses. In the red you see the word bimotav, and then below in the second verse, in verse 11, it says, I have in red Asham, and then I have in red Zera Ya'arich Yamin. The Hebrew term for in his death, in the singular form, is Bimoto. Clearly, the terms Bimoto and Bimotav are different. In Isaiah 53, 9, in giving you the parsing, this is the parsing of this to show you how this a construct works. What we call smichut in Hebrew is a construct. The bait there tells you it's a particle preposition that means in or at with mavet from the noun, a common masculine plural construct. Mavet means from mot. Mem, vav, tav, meaning death. Sometimes you see, if you look at Hebrew, like you see the term motumat. You, whenever you read the term motumat, you shall surely die. That's really, uh, so you know this, is kind of like a little extra thing. When you see motumat, or you're reading in the English, and it says you shall surely die, it almost means dead you will die. Meaning that God is telling you that this is significant. He's, when, he, when God uses the term death twice, you better take note. 
means he's not fooling around. The suffix, the vav there, so that when you put the bet, mavet, and the vav together to get bimotav, what you're seeing is a plural construct, third person masculine. masculine. So the proper translation of the first part of Isaiah 53, 9 is thus rendered from the Hebrew as, and he gave his grave to the wicked and to the wealthy in his deaths. It's plural in the Hebrew. It's not in his death because he committed no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. The plural makes it pretty clear that this is not speaking about a singular individual as one does not have deaths. Unless, of course, my Christian friends want to tell me that at the second coming, we're going to put him to death again. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, it shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. And I told you we were going to look at the words asham, and we were going to look at the phrase zera ya'arich yamim. The respective translations of the Hebrew phrase im tasim asham nafsho, which is the statement of condition A, meaning that there's we see a condition. God says, and if the servant makes himself asham, something happens. What are the things that happens? It says zera, he has seed, and yarich yamim, length of days. The Jewish translation has if his soul would acknowledge guilt. Because a sham means one or two things. A sham, if you ever study the sacrificial system, you'll see that a sham is one of the sacrifices. It's a guilt offering. But a sham can also mean to be guilty or to take on guilt. So the Jewish translation has, if his soul would acknowledge guilt. Whereas the King James Version has, when now shall make his soul an offering for sin. How could it be an offering for sin when an asham is not a chatat? If you look at the sacrificial system, a sin offering is called a, a chatat. A sham is a guilt offering. So once again, we have the Christian version presenting the vicarious atonement concept of an individual, which of course is incompatible with the Hebrew translation of the scriptures. To figure this out, we need to explore the meaning of asham. In the Hebrew scriptures, there are only two ways that it can be understood. One, it refers to a guilt offering and not a sin offering. And two, it refers to one being guilty or accepting guilt. What we have in this verse is a conditional statement. And this is not the only time that we see such statements in the Hebrew Bible. Here are two examples, just to illustrate. In Genesis 18, 26, it says, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous men within the city, then... I will forgive the entire place for their sake. So we have a condition in Jeremiah 18.8. Again, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turns from its evil, then I will relent of the evil that I intended to do them. So we have conditional verses all the time in the Tanakh. Clearly, the context of Isaiah 53.10 is that there is a reward being promised to Israel if the people admits their guilt and repent, what is the reward? Well, the Christian translation says, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. And in Hebrew, yireh zera yarich yamim, he might see offspring. Why is that significant? Here are the two problems with the Christian interpretation. Seed is viewed by them as spiritual offspring or followers. Anytime you talk to somebody about Isaiah 53 and you say to them, well, it says seed. Well, they say, well, you know, that's referring to all the followers of Jesus. That's his seed. That's his spiritual offspring. And the fact that they introduce the word his in the verse when it doesn't exist in the Hebrew. The answer to these problems from the Hebrew is that the word zerah always and exclusively refers to biological offspring. Always. Every single case, if you do a word-by-word -word search in the Tanakh on the Hebrew word zerah, it's always referring to biological offspring. Your opponent will always bring one verse where it says 
the zera of scoffers, the offspring of scoffers. See, it's not talking. No, it's talking about scoffers. It's 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 relating to Israel sinning against God and saying, "Your offspring, the offspring of scoffers, because you're sinners, your offspring will be punished as well." Okay, that's what it's talking about. So. Uh, by the way, you can't bring one verse. It's like I always say, most of these people that are my opponents, I call them the Henny Youngmans of Christianity. Some of you are probably too young to remember Henny Youngman, but he was an old vaudeville com comedian, and his favorite line was, take my wife, please. I always say with them, it's take my verse, please. Because what they do is, rather than looking at the full context of Tanakh, they bring one verse. I can show them that there are 100 verses where it says, Zerah, They'll bring one verse where they say it's not talking about biological offspring, and that's their argument. And they win. Doesn't matter how many I bring. The Hebrew for his seed, in the same way we looked at bimotom, bimotav, being the singular and plural, if it was going to say his seed, it would say zaro, not zera. So their introduction of his does not match what the Hebrew has. If the Hebrew scriptures actually refers to spiritual or figurative offspring, it will always use the terms ben or banim, sons, son or sons, the singular and the plural for son or sons, and never zerah, seed. As a matter of fact, you will see that zerah also is used for the Hebrew word sperm, specifically and comes from the Hebrew for sperm because it relates specifically and exclusively to physical offspring. Finally, the other part of the reward for the servant taking on guilt is length of days. And two things we know from their own historical accounts is that Jesus never had physical offspring and he did not have length of days. He did not have yarich yamin. Let's sum it up. The speaker is the rulers of the nations who are startled. The servant was hated and despised, and yet Jesus was followed by thousands. For our transgressions is really translated from our transgressions in Hebrew. This destroys the idea of vicarious atonement by the servant. Israel has been shown to be referred to as sheep sent to the slaughter in the Tanakh. Cut off from the land of the living refers to being cut off from Israel and not referring to death. Again, we see they are cut off from transgressions and not for transgressions, according to the Christian version. The Hebrew says his deaths, plural and not singular death. Asham is not a sin offering. Zerah always and exclusively means physical offspring. And length of days speaks for itself. For the missionary, there is no greater proof than Isaiah 53 that Jesus is the Messiah. They believe that if they can just get a Jewish person to read it with them, that the Jewish person will want to become a Christian. Each of you have now been given the tools to hopefully, hopefully have a missionary read these verses with you that I'm about to give you. From Isaiah 45, verse 20. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none other besides me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me, Hashem, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. And this is the culmination of salvation and redemption when in that day Hashem will be one and his name will be one. Amen. Mean. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, everybody on live stream. Be blessed.